I'm Sharon Lee. Today is August 20th, 2018. I'm in the Chancery Courtroom of the Rome County Courthouse in Kingston to interview Pope Cooley for the Legal History Project of the Tennessee Bar Foundation. State your name, please. James Pope Cooley, but I go by the name of J. Pope Cooley. Mr. Cooley, tell us where you were born. I was born in Harriman, Tennessee, May 19, 1926. And that makes you 92 years old, is that 92, correct? 92, yes. Um, tell me where, now Harriman's in Rome County, have you, except right. for going away to school and military service, have you lived anywhere but Rome County? Nowhere else. Have you ever wanted to live anywhere but Rome County? Nowhere else. <laughs> <laughs> tell me if you would about your grandparents, and I'll start here with your mother's uh, side my, of the family. My mother's parents were James Polk Daniel and his wife Nancy Cordelia Daniel. He was a machinist at the old Roan Iron Company and that was a large iron works there. And uh, he lived about two blocks from it. His family had been allowed to buy their home as close as you could from the old Roan Iron Company Instead of owning the home, they had a 99-year lease. They wouldn't sell to anyone. And now, did your um, grandmother, did she work outside the home? No, she didn't. How many uh, children did, did they have? He had two sets of children. Maybe five by his first wife who died. And then with Nancy, he may have had four. So she worked, uh, your grandmother did a lot of work in the home. Oh, sure. With nine, sure. nine kids. Um, did you spend a lot of uh, time with your mother's parents? No. They both died. My grandfather died about the same year I was born. And you were named after your grandfather. Right. All right. And my grandmother died when I was only four. So I didn't really get to know them that well. All right. And now tell me about your grandparents on your father's side, the Cooley side. There's a good old Irishman, John J. Cooley, and his wife, Sarah. And they were real nice people. I guess he was my favorite relative. And did they live close by? They lived in Harriman. Harriman. And from the age of two on, I lived in Rockwood. So did you... Um, visit them pretty often? Frequently. Maybe once in the summer, that was about it. But we would visit about every summer. All right. Um, tell me your mother's name. Anna Pearl Daniels Cooley. And she was born when? May? No, June 4, 1896. And I believe she died at the age of Almost 99. She was about two months shy of 99. She died in February, I believe, 95. Did she um, live in Rockwood yes. her whole life? All except a few, a few years when she married. All right. She moved to Harriman where she married. And was she married just one time and That's was that it. to your dad? That was it. All right. Tell me, uh, what did your mother do for a living? Well, she had had a little bit of college at East Tennessee State, and then she had some business college in Knoxville. That was unusual back in those days, it wasn't was, it? It was, yes. And uh, she took a job with a wholesale company in Harriman. And then when she moved to Rockwood, she uh, really needed a job, and that was 1928. And she got a job with Dr. George Ed Wilson, who was a Vanderbilt graduate and had a primary practice there in Rockwood. She stayed with him better than 25 years. She was an unusual woman. She was, was indeed. She? Now what stands out in your memory about her? Well, you think of a woman who's just divorced. She had an impossible marriage. Three children. And the, right on top of the, the uh, Great Depression. And she took this job, she was making $30 a month. 
she got off at noon on Sunday. Mm. And she'd come by the doctor's office about a block from the Christian church. She'd come by church and pick us up and walk us home. But she walked over a mile to work every day and, and back. So, and how many children did she have? Three. And you, were you the youngest? I was a baby. You're the baby. Tell me the, your brothers and sisters' names and Well, my brother difference. was Daniel Joseph Cooley. He was born in 1920. And my sister was June Elizabeth Cooley, and she was born December about 1924. During those years when your mother worked all those long hours, who looked after you and your brother and sister? Once in a while she could bring someone in, but for the most part, she was like an army sergeant. <laughs> She would leave in the mornings and delegate things to be done, and we did them. Did you ever think about not doing them? We didn't give that any thought at all. <laughs> I mean, she had it done. She was very stern. She loved us, but she, she knew and we knew that it had to be done. In terms of economic classification, you know, rich, middle class, poor, how did you all fall in that? Ranking. Oh gosh, every nickel counted. Thirty dollars a month, yeah. uh, and that wasn't unusual. The hosier mill at Rockwood, the women made more per day, but at that point the depression started. The mill might only work two days a week, so she did have a regular schedule, and she was able to count on that thirty dollars. So there, was there any money for any extras ever? She wouldn't try to go to court and, and force money from her ex-husband. She thought that was trashy. To get child support was trashy. And I'm glad she didn't. Now he, She was independent. I'm going to ask you about your father more later, but you've mentioned him here. Um, your mother and father were divorced when you were very young, or when all the children were young, is that right? Oh, I would say that divorce went to not later than 1928. And I was born in 26, so it was pretty early. Early. And did your father ever support the family? No. It was all up to your mother? Right. I would say that my grandfather, his father, may have helped some. Yeah, were, were there other, with your father not in the picture, were there other family members who stepped in and helped take his place, or did it all pretty much fall on your mother? Well, one great help. My mother had a sister, Mabel Duckett, who was married to Glenn Duckett, and they, so, like so many ten sins, went to Michigan to find work. So they let mother have their home, and that was a savior. So you had a place to live, and right. then her income basically put food on the table and right. clothes Free on your rent. back. Now you we talked about um, you living in Rockwood and Harriman. For people who don't know Roan County, how far apart are Rockwood, Harriman, and in they're, Kingston all in Roan County? They're about 12 miles and there's a valley road which is now U.S. Highway 27 that ran straight down from Harriman to Rockwood made an easy transportation. So they were fairly within 10 or 12 miles of each other. Sure. Um, what was your father's name? John Lewis Cooley. And I'm going to, we're going to talk more about him later, but I wanted to ask you about your uh, brother and your sister. Now you were, as I think you said you were both the youngest. Now did, how long did they, how old were they when they passed away? My brother Dan was 92 and uh, he called me one day right after his birthday and said folk I've got cancer I said how do you know well he said I've been told by my doctor and I said well let's be sure let's go see someone who would, would be sure about it and he did so he only lasted six months he was born in 1920 
and uh, it, it went pretty fast. Mm -hmm. And then your sister, uh, how old was she when she died? She was about 51. She uh, developed lung cancer. She smoked. And I guess that would have been the cause. What was it like growing up in, uh, in Roan County? Well, Rockwood was especially poverty-stricken. We depended greatly on the Roan Iron Company, which produced pig iron. And it was one of the biggest uh, smelting places between Ohio and uh, Birmingham. Had good, good uh, uh, labor force there. Had a lot of black people who worked there. And uh, when that closed down about 1929 with the Depression, things really came to a screeching halt in Rockwood. The hosiery mill, as I say, was, was in operation, but they might not have orders to work more than two days, three days a week. So uh, jobs were hard to come by. The smelting plant, what did they make? The, the, the smelting the, plant, what was that was oh, their they made production? Pig iron. And what is that? <laughs> well it's a basic iron that's used for for re re remelting and redoing other other work. Uh, that's about the best I can say about pig iron. Did did that smelting plant get back up in operation during World War Two? Yes. They got back about nineteen forty making a manganese. I don't know much about that, but it was used, I think, in the, the real hard steel for, for naval ships. And they had good work then. Mm -hmm. And I guess that would have been in the, probably got geared up in the early 40s? Yes. But between 19, say, 28 and 30 to the early 40s, it was pretty lean times. Oh, it was bad news, yes. Did they have government assistance programs then to help? If they did, I don't remember them. Uh, for example, the, the hosier mill went on strike. And uh, those men, I can remember, the men on strike received a small bag of cornmeal and a little bit of streaking meat while they were on strike. And that's what they were supposed to get by on. Was that from the, were they unionized? Yes, they and were. And that came from the union. Well, they, they didn't succeed. They attempted to unionize. Mm -hmm. But Mr. Huff, J.A. Huff, who owned the uh, hosier mill, or at least was the controlling stockholder, was close friends with the governor. And he brought the state militia over. They broke up the strike. <laughs> Interesting. What, what are your, just in, the, in terms of growing up as a young man or young boy in in uh, Rockwood, what are some things you remember doing that that were fun? Well, I don't think there was a lot to do. You know, some of us would get together four or five of us and play mumbly pig. Do you ever hear of that? No, tell me how that played. That's how when you, you play would that. take a knife and open the blade and have different devices by which you could throw it up and make it go into the ground and stand up. So young boys playing pig. with young boys playing with knives. That sounds dangerous. Right. <laughs> well, a young boy had to have a knife back then. Right. And did you have guns in your home as well? No. 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 All right. Um, where did you go to school? I started school in a little one-room schoolhouse about a hundred yards behind my home. The real sweet lady named Annie Molyneux, who was a career school teacher. And uh, mother didn't have anyone to keep me, so she can send me up there, and Miss Annie was my babysitter. At wh what age did you start going to that school? At five. Five. Uh -huh. It gave you a little head start in school, didn't it? Well, I think so, but I didn't know this until years later that... Uh, there was some controversy surrounding whether I would graduate from the first grade. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? Well, Mother had a talk with the teacher, and they weren't sure that I was prepared for the second grade. <laughs> so, 
So you and almost they, failed the first grade. They decided to take a chance and <laughs> give me two months. The second grade teacher was downtown named Dolly Bush. She was a sweetheart. They gave me two months, I didn't know this, to see if I could pick up on it and, and kind of <laughs> compete in school. And apparently I got by with it. I think you've done quite well. Um, so you went to the one-room school there behind you, behind your home, and yes. then you went into town? Into town, the second grade. For second grade. Now, what was the name of that school? Rockwood Grammar School, I suppose. And then did, you did okay in second grade? Sure. All right. I got by. I'll never forget the fourth grade. I was left-handed at that time and wrote upside down, as left-handers often do. We didn't have ink. That is, we didn't have ballpoint. We had ink. Mm. And you could really come down and mess up your writing. So I'll never forget the fourth grade. One of Mother's good friends was the teacher. She sent down to Dolly Bush, my friend in the second grade, and had two students come up with a sheet of their writing and had me stand up in the front of the class with a sheet of mine and one of those on each side and let all the students have a big laugh. Now, I haven't forgotten that. Mm. Did you change your writing after that? No, I couldn't change my writing. <laughs> Did they try to get you to write with your right hand? If they did, it wasn't much. I don't remember it. But I had to change, and uh, when I was 19, I, I crushed that hand. And uh, after about two or three months, they saw it wasn't doing any good. So they rebroke it, and, and by that time, I had started writing with my right hand. So I never did write, write well with either one, but I gave up on my left. Now, how did how did you get that hand injury? Automobile accident. Mm. All right. Um, so you went to all the way through school at Rockwood. Yes. Rockwood. Yes. Uh, grammar and then high school. And, yes. Um, did you play any sports or have any activities in school? Oh, I played football, and I had the good fortune of playing football with Thomas Paul Pemberton. You probably haven't heard the name, but he was an outstanding athlete. And uh, we had a good football team. So that's about all I really cared for in school. We enjoyed it. Did you make good grades? No. <laughs> <laughs> Were you interested in any of your classes in school? Not particularly, no. Did you ever get in trouble? Yes. <laughs> I thought that's what you were going to say. What, what sort of things did you get in trouble for? Well, we had a demerit-based uh, 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 rating that they would give us, and on 16 demerits, you were, you were uh, put out of school. In my senior year, I was practicing in the senior play, and uh, I was called to the, the uh, professor's office, superintendent, and I had, I think, 15 demerits at that time. I thought, this is it. I'm out of school. <laughs> but when I got there, he was telling me he wanted to congratulate me that I had made it through the month without another demerit. <laughs> <laughs> what did you get demerits for? Oh, I don't know. Just We just didn't listen to the teacher. And we, we had fun, you know. For example, it was, a, it was a bonus to be able to erase the blackboard. I don't know if you've had that in school, but uh, the teacher would call on her favorites to erase the blackboard. And I had a way that I had devised in my mind that I wanted to erase that blackboard. And I was going to get all the way across, down one, all the way across and began. And the teacher became impatient with that and told me to hurry it up, and I would not hurry it up. So she fired me. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you were independent in high school. Well, I had, I had my own thoughts about things, yes. <laughs> um, did you work any side jobs when you were in school? Did you yes. have side jobs? Yes. And what were some of those? Uh, Mr. Jim King, we called him Pop King, had a grocery store in Rockwood, which was one mile from my home. 
and I would be there at 7.30 on Saturday mornings, and we would get off about 10 that night. And uh, I made a dollar. Did you walk there and back? Sure. We had no car. Uh, in fact, uh, somewhere along the line, I would, I would go straight from work when I got off at 10 across the street to the pool room and usually <laughs> lose, lose my money in that pool <laughs> tournament there. You, uh, if you felt like you could beat whoever was at the table, you laid a nickel down that would get you the next one in the line, and I'd probably lose my dollar. <laughs> but somewhere I started turning up an extra quarter in my pocket. I didn't know where it came from. And Mrs. King was folding my dollar and putting that quarter in it and handing it to me at the end of the day. I finally, after two or three weeks, learned I'd gotten a 25 cent raise. <laughs> Did you walk to school and back? Sure. That was an adventure. Uh, by the time I was about a mile and a quarter from school and a lot of kids would come in from various places and join you as you went so we'd end up with a crowd and it wasn't unusual for the, the kids to get in a fight and the school never did anything about it. Did you ever get in any fights? Sure. Did, sure. You, did you usually win? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> After um, Graduating from high school, uh, did you uh, go into the military, or was there a period of time in between? Well, I finished at 16, so I had a year before I had to worry about the service. And I went to Oak Ridge first, and uh, I was too young to get a job. So I went to the Rockwood Furnace and got a job there. And uh, it was as a sample boy which meant that I had to go to every department in the furnace and get a sample of things. I'd go into the uh, coal cars and take a bucket and take a sample of the coal. I'd go into the uh, uh, ovens and get a sample there. The worst thing was to, the hardest thing, was to get a sample of the iron metal when it came out of the furnace, when it was ready to cast. And it was not iron, it was mag mag the type of steel that I was talking about. Uh, when it was ready, they'd take a rod about one and a half, two inches in diameter, a long steel rod, and drive it with a sledgehammer through the closure that they had, and then pull it out, and let me tell you, that hot iron coming out, if, if it struck just a, a small wet portion in the sand, it blew straight up. And when it got on you, it just ate through your skin. But I would have to get samples of that because that was the main thing we had to, uh, to run at the laboratory was the quality of the steel it put out. And were there any federal or state safety rules they uh, follow there. <laughs> not likely. <laughs> we were not told about them anyway. <laughs> if there were any, you did not know about it. No. <laughs> um, what year did you graduate from high school? 1943. So, what? now you said you graduated at 16. How were you able to get through school at, at 16? It sounds like you got out a year early. Did, did you no, start I did, early? I just started a year early. Right. I started at five, five instead of at six. Um, what now in forty? You said forty-three. Yes. What was going on in the world at that time? Oh my goodness! Uh, we were in the war, you know, starting with December forty-one. So uh, the war was going hot and heavy, and I was told about a a special class I could get into. It was called uh, the Navy. V-5 program, where they would train you to be Navy pilots. My mother learned about that from the doctor's office, people talking there. So uh, I went, I at that time was working at Oak Ridge. I did get on there in September of 43, and uh, I went to some of my old classmates who were not already in service and got their physics books. I didn't take anything like physics, math, 
chemistry. I didn't take those hard subjects. I took typing because there was no homework. <laughs> so uh, I did try to learn a little something, and my goodness, I started reading that physics book, and they came up with this word torque. I thought, what the hell is this? <laughs> did you, torque. Did you figure it out? <laughs> Finally figured it out, but at any rate, I passed the test. We went to Atlanta and were examined, and I came home with a, a little set of wings about an inch and a half wide, golden wings with a blue center, and I was so proud. Uh, so they sent us to college. And before I got to pre-flight, I was in this automobile accident. And the base, at the foot of my bed, they had the, the list of injuries. And they just said the fractures extreme. So I didn't qualify as a pilot. Huh. Where did you have your uh, car wreck? In Johnson City. And I was so sent to a hospital there. And that's where they really mangled up on my hand. And they sent me to the finest orthopedic hospital in the country, Millington, above Memphis. They brought in doctors there from all the great hospitals in the United States. And they had the best orthopedic service, I believe, you yeah. could get from them. They took care of the Pacific Theater and the European Theater. And you were able to get that because you were in this pilot training program through the yes. military? Yes. So you would have been 17? I guess so, 17 yes. or 18 at that time? Mm-hmm. More like 17. Was there ever any doubt in your mind after getting out of high school that you were going to enlist in, in the military, that you would serve in the military and serve in the war efforts? Well, I would have been proud to, yes. There wasn't any doubt about that. Is it? But I, I welcomed that opportunity to work for a year. We, we got seven days, 12 hours, a lot of overtime, a lot of double time, and I was able to pay my uncle for the home we lived in. He had no purpose, purpose in it. And I was able to buy that from my mother. After that, just that one year's work? Right. You worked a lot of long hours. And long long hours, time. yes. And there's no time left for, <laughs> for a, a, a entertainment, you know, or spending your money. Do you remember what you paid for that house? $600, I believe. And that was a lot of money it was in those days. Yes. But all three of her children were in service. And uh, she did have that. That, that, uh, that dependence that she, she had at home. And your sister was in the service? Yes, she was a, a nurse, lieutenant. Okay, and your brother, what? what he was in the Navy. Navy. Now, why did you pick the Navy? Is it because of the... Well, that program was beautiful, beautiful. That's why I picked it. So you could be a, a, a Navy pilot. Right. I'm curious as to, I think you, you said that your mother found out about it through the doctor's office. But right. That was lucky to, that you even found out about that program, Well, back wasn't at it? that time, doctors would fill up their office during the day. You didn't have appointments. Not half the people had phones. They would just mm -hmm. come to the doctor's office. They would sit around there all day waiting to be served. So there's not a lot of talk. So and that's she, where she heard about so it. So she heard about it through her work. Right. Um, so when you, you were how old when you joined the Navy? I guess I was 17 18? when I went in. Maybe I had just turned 18. because I'm, I, I, I would have because it was in the June of 44. And I had just turned 18. And you served... Two years? Were you discharged in 46? 46, yes. And what did you do during your two years in well, the Navy? After school, I was able to go aboard a destroyer. And I had a real good time on that. <laughs> I had the worst job you could have down in the furnace, in the very hold of the ship. 
you'd be between two oil furnaces and you'd have to keep them going all the time with, with metal rods going in. We worked awfully hard, but uh, I enjoyed it. Where were you? Where were you stationed? Well, we started out in uh, California. I went aboard this destroyer. It had been over in the Pacific Theater, and uh, we made the trip down the uh, Pacific, the Panama Canal, came through the canal and back up to Norfolk, and then on back up to Casco Bay in uh, in uh, Maine. What's the name of that town in Maine? Anyway, Casco Bay was the largest bay, I guess, that we had in the country. They put together all of the big armadas there to take across to England and Russia. And uh, it was a huge bay. What was the name of the destroyer you were on? Do you remember? The Charles S. Sperry, S-P-E-R-Y, D-D-697. <laughs> and how long were you? For how long were you actually on that destroyer? I'd say about six months. Did you stay in the military then after 46 or no. was that it? No. You know, I heard that Admiral Halsey was going to take a task force all around the world and call it at every major port. And that just sounded great. So I called my mother to tell her what I had decided to do. She had all three of her children in service. <laughs> and she about burnt that telephone line up, explaining why I shouldn't do that. <laughs> so you listened to your mother and came home? So I came home. How did your uh, two years in the Navy uh, influence the rest of your life? They were good years. I, I enjoyed it, especially the college years. I had been such a poor student in high school, and in those college years I met people there who were very serious about education, about their studies, and, and I became interested in it, and I think it made a big difference. Were you able to get the GI Bill then, and is that what enabled you to go to college, is yes. that military experience? Yes. And, and where did you, after getting out in 46, what did you do then? Well, I took a summer of a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do? You know, we summer? were on a twenty dollar a week payment from the army, from the military. It's called the Fifty Two Twenty Club, and uh, I don't know how long we got it, but we got it that summer, and we had a good time. You could buy beer with that twenty dollars, <laughs> and uh, started school in September of forty forty six. And where did you go to college? UT, University of Tennessee. Now, did you go to Milligan? Did you yes. go to Milligan? That's where the Navy had taken over Milligan. And that's where I attended my first year in college. Was that before your car wreck? Yes. Okay, that's where you had your car accident then. That's right. All right, so then when you went to service and completed that, then you came back and went to UT. Um, now, why did you pick UT? Well, or University of Tennessee in Knoxville, I should say. You know, uh, it was our neighbor, um, our home school, and uh, it had a real good reputation. So why not? I didn't. I don't think I even given it gave any thought to any other school. And your, uh, we we mentioned earlier, you you went on the GI Bill. Did you have um, side jobs while you were in school to help support yourself? <laughs> Yes, I worked at the Kearns Bakery. <laughs> and what hours did you work they there? They were good to people. They would let us take our shift if we wanted. Okay. So I would get out of class at 2 o'clock at law school and uh, be over there by 3 and get off at 10. And they paid us well. I think it was around 95 cents an hour. And I'll never forget, there was some boy there, we were at the end of an assembly line, taking loaves of bread, putting them in a box. And this boy I was working with was probably at the peak of his, his <coughs> work period, career. And he asked me something about what I was doing, and I was so proud to have been admitted to law school. 
Then I told him very boastfully, I'm a student at the law school. I'm studying law. And he held his up head up there a minute thinking and said, oh, you're, you're going to be a policeman, are you? <laughs> but he really burst my bubble. <laughs> Did, how many years did you go to UT as an undergraduate before you started law school? Well, I had the Milligan benefit, so I only won about one full calendar year before I entered law school. Cool. And did you, um, when you were going to the University of Tennessee, did you live there in, around campus? Or did I you, did, on White uh, Avenue. White Avenue. I know where that is. I lived on White Avenue, too. Um, did you live in one of those old houses? Right, right. Did you have a bunch of, um, uh, usually those, a lot of people lived in those houses with you. Did you have a house full of people? We did have, yes. Were there law students? Or ha how did you find your roommates? I think I had a friend in Rockwood, yes, a fellow named Harry Young. He and I had grown up together and, uh, we roomed together there. Later, by the time I got through my free law and got in law school, I had married, and I had rented a house out at uh, South Knoxville. It was owned by Sam Horn. Do you remember that name? Mm -hmm. I do. I know after I got through there and was in home in practice, the IRS got after Sam. <laughs> had a trial, and I was subpoenaed there to testify what rent I paid. And that might have been rent money that did not get reported. It may not have been reported. reported. <laughs> At what point did you buy a, a car, an automobile? Oh, I, I came home. I had a, a mentor, Lloyd McLuhan, who was a graduate of uh, the school in Middle Tennessee. Uh, what was the name of it? You know the one I mean? I do. I know. I'm trying to think of the name All of right. it. It's uh, Cumberland, Cumberland Law School. Cumberland. Yes. And uh, he invited me to set up an office next door to him. He was upstairs, a steep set of stairs, over a grocery store. And uh, the, the rooms were about 12 to 15 feet high. And this one, the Bristol man who owned the building, had to do some work on it. He had to put in a one... Uh, a set of uh, fluorescent bulbs and paint the walls and put in a tile floor. I think he spent $120 on it and I rented it to him for $10 a month. And I just hoped I could be there long enough that he'd get his money back. <laughs> now, did he help you get your first car? Did he help you get well, that? Well, McLuhan would carry me to, to uh, court. And uh, I got my first car about December of that year. I started practice in September. And I got a 1949 Ford with a heater and a radio. <laughs> Pretty nice car back in those days, yeah, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, a new car. Uh, and then what year did you finish law school? In uh, August of uh, 49. You see, we took the bar in February 49. When you were still in law school? Yes, at that time, two years of law school would enable you to take the bar. So I was admitted to practice in March of 49, and then finished law school in August. Hmm. Any, what uh, special memories or things stand out in your mind about law school days? Well, I loved it. We had an old judge, retired chancellor, Robert M. Jones, who taught equity. He would rear back in his chair and say, gentlemen, the law is a jealous mistress. She will demand all of your time. And he was right. He was a wise man. He was. Yes, he, he couldn't hear well. But he, he was teaching equity, and he could get by on that. He'd been a chancellor. What were your favorite classes in law school? What subjects did you enjoy most? Harold Warner was by far the best instructor I had. 
he taught real property, as you know, and it was a complicated subject. It was not easy. I had him the first quarter, and we knew it was Colonel Warner. He had just come out of the service, and he was very demanding, but he was very good. I enjoyed him. And you use real property throughout your practice. What you learned in that class, did you have you used that throughout your practice? Absolutely, yes. I took the real property one and then they had a second year of it, second semester. And uh, I took them both under him. Let me go back a minute. When did you decide you wanted to be a lawyer? I think by the time I was in the Navy, uh, I was up at the University of Louisville and visited the law building up there and I just enjoyed it so much and I decided then I wanted to try it. So when I got home there was an accountant named uh, Jimmy Smith who had two books on uh, the law and I got those books from him and read them and that was in the summer of 46 and that made up my mind that I was going to finish my pre-law and go into law school. So your Navy experience, probably, what you learned in the Navy helped you make that decision to be a lawyer. yes, it did. Did you know any lawyers before you went to law school? No, now this Lloyd McLuhan was my scoutmaster. I knew him through that. He had, uh, he had been in the Navy in World War II, and uh, I would visit him once in a while, and he'd kind of hint that he would let me come in and start next door to him and use his library, which he did. Um, you, you mentioned that while you were in law school you got married. Who, what was your wife's name? Mary Sue East. And where did you meet her? In Rockwood. Rockwood. Is she, was she a Rockwood girl that you had known? I hadn't throughout? known her before. Just met her there. Yes. Okay. Now, how long were y'all, what year did you get, did you marry her? We got married in uh, 47, and uh, she came with me. She wasn't out of high school. She went to uh, uh, a South school, Young High School, Young High School. In Rock, in, in Knoxville. Rock, in Knoxville. Mm -hmm. All right, so... Was she from Rockwood? Yes. But why did she go to high school in Knoxville? Because she was married to me. Oh, I see. Oh, I, I, I'm, <laughs> I got ahead of myself. <laughs> so how old was she when you married her? She must have been about 18 at the best. Maybe 17. <laughs> <laughs> so you all moved to Knoxville and for your schooling, and, that's, and she continued then her, high, her schooling. At yes. high school, and that's that would have been the school that would have been closer to where you lived. Right. Young was a down south Knoxville. Mm hmm All right. Now, how long were you married to her? I say two years. And then you. Uh, she had worked for an insurance company there after she got out of school. Had a good job, and uh, I think we were both. About the time we thought we'd been married long enough. After two years. Yeah. All right. So I still keep up with her. She's in Florida, and uh, have her phone number. We talk once in a while. All right. And is she, um, so she would be, what, eighty nine or ninety now? I'd say so. Yes. Just a little younger than you. Were you married again? Yes. How many times have you been married? Five. All right. Tell me your wife's name. There's nothing to brag about, I'm sorry. But I'll never forget Judge Jones saying that the law is a jealous mistress. I think I devoted too much time to the law, and maybe I didn't devote enough time to my marriages. It's a hard thing to balance those right. interests, especially when you love the law as much as you do. My second marriage was to the mother of my four boys. And what was her name? Irma, E-R-M-A, Irma Charles. And where did you meet her? In Rockwood. She came, she, she grew up in Blount County, and uh, she and some of her family
family came down to Rockwood and I met her there. And how long were you married to her? About 17 years, I believe. Do you remember? Maybe a little more. When you first, what, what year did you, did you marry her? Were you practicing law? Yes, I was in practice. Okay. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't remember the, the year. Well, just, you were a young lawyer. Yes, it was around 55. Okay. Around 1955. And then you, you were married to her for about 17 years right. and had four children. And I'll ask you about, about your boys later. Uh, and then did you, you married again? Who, who, who was your third wife? The third wife was uh, Babette Steinhauser. Where did you meet her? Is she from Rockwood too? No, she uh, had married a doctor and moved to Kingston. And uh, I married her and we, we were together 10 years. We had no children. She had two sons by prior marriage and I took care of those two sons and uh, we got along fine. She wanted to live in Charleston. Charleston. Don't ask me why, but she moved to Charleston. Uh, South Carolina or Tennessee? Yeah. yeah. South Carolina? South Carolina. And uh, she had gone to the University of Florida and had a degree in, in uh, something that allowed her to work for newspapers. So she worked for a, a law firm down there, one that was big in cigarette suits. I can't think of the name of them, but... I, I know who you're talking about. I'm, yeah. I'll think of it later. And I take it you didn't want to move to Charleston because... Absolutely you, not. <laughs> you weren't going to leave Rome County. No. So you all divorced. Yes. And um, who was your, your fourth wife? Well, she was also my fourth wife. Okay. <laughs> about a month later we remarried. And then how long did that last? That didn't last but a few months. All right. And then um, your fifth wife. Mm -hmm. What was the name of your... Well, she was your third she and fourth. She was the fourth wife, okay. third and fourth. All right. And the fifth was one named Joan Watson. We were married for uh, 20 years. And we then, only divorced about 2011. And she's still alive? Does she still live in this area? No, she lives in a uh, naval base there in Florida. On, on the... Uh, on the Panhandle? Panhandle. The, uh, anyway, I know that's where, where it she is, lives. but can't think of the name of it. Yeah, yeah. Do you still stay in touch with her? No. No? No, we don't stay in touch. Just your first wife? We had a, we had a bad divorce. Mm -hmm. The only one that's been bad. All the rest of them stayed on good terms. All right. You've, uh, we've mentioned Rockwood a lot. You had some wives from Rockwood. Um, sounds like Rockwood's the center of the universe. How many people live in Rockwood or lived in Rockwood at that time? Maybe 5,000. All right. Pretty small town, though. Sure. Uh, I, I loved it. I loved Still it. do. I live now here in Kingston, but... Uh, I still have my office in Rockwood. Oh, you've been married five times. Do you, do you recommend marriage? I do. I do. Yes, I, I don't like this living alone, but I'm determined to make it alone now. Well, now, don't, don't never say never. <laughs> yes, I think at my age I can say <laughs> never. All right. Um, you mentioned that you, you had your... Uh, your four boys from with your marriage from Irma. Now tell me about your your boys. I know you're very proud of them. Oh, they are great. Yes, yes. I I was so wild back at the time. I stood a good chance of losing them, but I decided that's that's my treasure. My oldest one is named Ted. He's now about sixty-seven, and uh, he went to Middle Tennessee State. And when he got out, he was looking for a job. We had him a job with uh, 
well, if he is with now, but he got this offer from the hosier mill. And I said, son, whatever you do, run up there and take that, and I'll make up for you on whatever your job is. So he went to the hosier mill in Rockwood, Burlington had it. They sent him to North Carolina later, and he ended up being in his own mill. Did well. He's got now what's called a Wellington Mills in uh, uh, North Carolina. And he also has set up a plant down in uh, Costa Rica where he get cheap work. He got some of those little black-eyed girls up in North Carolina and they worked so much better than anybody else that he went to Costa Rica and set up a mill with them. And he lives uh, where in North Carolina? He lives in uh, between, well, very near, very near, gosh, I can't think of the name, the, the place now. Is it near Greenville? Near Greenville? South, south of Greenville, South yes. of Greenville. Uh-huh. He uh, came home about seven years ago from Costa Rica. And on a Sunday, and his, his boys called me. He has uh, two sons that they thought he'd had a stroke. And it turned out, after three months in a, three weeks in the hospital, that he had the, uh, oh, it's, it's a, it's a, you can have it in the spine or you can have it in the brain. Meningitis? Is it a form of meningitis? Meningitis, That's spinal meningitis, meningitis. And then up in the brain it's called something else. That's what he had. Hmm. So he was disabled from working for five years. Wow. And he's just now getting back. He's, he's into sales at his place. He, he, he was never real big. He, he had the one year contracts maybe. You needed have to retrain your, your force for another contract. But he, might, he, he did all right. Sounds like he's done very well. Um, now, your second son. That was Jim. Name, Jim. He uh, went to UT for about one semester and didn't like it. He went up to East Tennessee State and finished up there in secondary education. So when he came home, we sent out about 50 applications for work had to have a photograph on every one of them. And he took a job with the Rockwood Electric Utility, the groundman's job, they call him a grunt. And he liked the work so well he wouldn't even consider teaching. <laughs> so he recently retired as the outside superintendent of the uh, utility. In, here in, in, in Rome County. Right, at Rockwood. So how, how close does he live to you? Well, he lives maybe, you mean to my office? Mm -hmm. He lives about a mile from the office. Okay. We have lunch together a lot. Now, Ted was born in 1951. Right. Is that right? And, and Jim in 1955. Right. And then Pat. Then there was Pat. Pat, 1958. Tell me about Pat. Well... Pat was always a good student. He was an outstanding athlete. Great coordination. And uh, he attended Tennessee Tech and then uh, law school in Memphis. I was disappointed that he didn't make it at Tennessee. He applied there, but it wasn't accepted. And Pat has made a, a very good lawyer. Has he practiced with you throughout his career? He practiced with me in my office about three years, maybe, or four. By that time, we had him set up for Kingston. And he went over there, and he, uh, he got John Agee to practice with him. You may know of John. John's a real good student. John had finished in Tulane. And uh, later on, John married one of the Ridner daughters. I knew then we lost him. So he, he went with the Ridner firm and Pat uh, built an office out here 
in what's called the, uh, I can't think of an SML, out from the center of town, Kingston. He has a real nice office. I wish we could have set up our interview there. Uh, has a, a real nice uh, conference room. Anyway, Pat uh, finished school and came with me, and now he's in practice. And your office, was it in Rockwood? Yes. You practiced out of a Rockwood office right. your whole career. And I'm solo there. You're solo. And then Pat is in Kingston. Right. He, he shows you're off council, I believe, on his letterhead. He does, yes. Is that, are you the rainmaker for that firm? They see that maybe, name and they come maybe in. Maybe I have been in past years, <laughs> I doubt now. What was it like practicing with, with Pat? When well, he's I enjoyed with you. it. I enjoyed it. He's spontaneous, and uh, he's made a real good trial lawyer, real good criminal lawyer. He went to we sent him to all the seminars in Texas and everywhere, so he learned a lot. Well, and, he learned uh, a lot from you too. <laughs> do you think? Possibly. <laughs> and then uh, your fourth son, your baby boy. What's his name? That's David. Uh, and he was born in 1961. Yes. David tried to get on with the uh, trial lawyers organization in Nashville. And now where did where did David go to school? He went to uh, Tennessee Tech and got his degree there. And he he got on with the medical group out there. And then somehow, David went to Boys State, which I went to about the third one they had. And, and you're David talking then, about American Legion of right, Boys State. Right. And then he went to their nation's state in Washington. Well, and now to, to go to Boys State Nation, he had was he a governor, elected governor of Boys State? No. How, was he a... A national delegate? He was a national delegate, apparently. All right. So he went to, to uh, Washington, to nation's, whatever you call it, they called it. And uh, about 17, he got into management of uh, the governor's campaign, the young Clement boy. Bob? Bob. Bob's yes. campaign? He managed Bob's campaign. Disturbed me, they had him signing notes for campaign expenses <laughs> at 17. <laughs> and I was disturbed over that. But uh, anyway, that got him into politics. And he then uh, went with a public relations firm in Nashville. And then he managed Bredesen uh, first on his city election, mayor. And then he managed the first governor race, which he lost. That was uh, about 92, I guess. And then he managed his next governor's race, which they won. And he stayed with Bredesen four years. He and, actually uh, served as Mayor Bredesen's chief of staff when he was mayor and right. as deputy governor than when he was governor. Yes. Is that right? Yes. So, uh, he since has been on his own, you know. Do you, did, did Dave think about going to law school? I don't know. He never mentioned it to me if he was thinking about it. He had the political bug. Right. Now, do you, do you have grandchildren? Do I have? You, grandchildren? I have you, about six, yes. All right. I think this might be a good time to take a short break. All right. Polk, in addition to your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren, you have a special relationship with your nieces and nephews, do you? Absolutely. Now yes. tell me how that came about. Well, my sister was married to uh, a boy from China, Tony Min, M-I-N. And uh, they met at the University of Tennessee, I think. <clears throat> he 
was intent, as many uh, Asians are, on getting the most education he could get. So he went on to Auburn and got a, a PhD in engineering, heating and cooling. Then he went to Minnesota and uh, they just wore out their marriage with that. They divorced and the strange thing to me is that uh, when they divorced, he just left his, his married life entirely. And he left a wife and three children? Did yes. they have three children? Yes. And the only way we could contact him was through his lawyer. And uh, I never did understand that. I think of Asians as being tight in their family. But, but not he on wasn't. This one. So, so June came to Rockwood and lived, and uh, her three children were sort of the ages of my children, and they all blended very well. So they grew up together. Did you step in financially and uh, as a father figure to those children? I may have helped them a little bit financially, but uh, mostly it was just being there and we were all together. And why did you do that? Hmm? And why did you do that? Well, why not? What, what, what choice would you have? Exactly. They were, they were all good students, children. And they're... Uh, and not to single any one of the three out because I know they're all exceptional, but Nancy Ann, uh, your niece, has gone on to do very great things, correct? Yeah. Uh, she lives in New York, is that right? No, she lives in Maryland. In Maryland? Right up about 30 miles above D.C. And she had a rather prominent role in the White House in the creation of the Affordable Care Act. Yes, she did well with that, and she... She liked working with President Obama. She was about number three there at the time. Uh, but she enjoyed that. And she, as a very young lawyer, uh, served as commissioner of the Tennessee Department of Human Services. Right. Went to Harvard Law School, Rhodes Scholar. The governor called her his, uh, what was that? Anyway, his treasure. After law school, <clears throat> did you turn? You came back to Roan County to practice law. Sure did. Did you ever think about going anywhere else? No, no. And you, um, do you remember when you first started practicing law? Absolutely. What was that like? Well, actually, I bought a an Underwood typewriter, an old one for ten dollars, while I was in law school. After I had gotten my license to practice. And I began doing collections down in Roan County. And I would type letters, and I was so proud that they were not letterhead paper, but I'd put it at the bottom, J. Polk Cooley, Attorney at Law. Oh, that was nice. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and I would write stiff collection letters to people. And that typewriter, if you typed an O, it just made a hole in the paper. <laughs> that was the O. <laughs> when were you licensed to practice law in Tennessee? Hmm? What year were you licensed to practice law? February 49. And who introduced you to the court for the first time? Ray Jenkins. And how did you how did you know Ray Jenkins? Don't remember now. How, well now Ray had married a Rockwood lady. His wife died. And we had a lady in Rockwood who was a widow. Very attractive lady. She had the same name as Ray's first wife. <laughs> and he married her. And that may have had something to do with my knowing him. I, I don't remember for sure. Well, now, for those who, people who are not acquainted with Ray Jenkins, who was, uh, who was Ray Jenkins? Well, he was probably the most famous lawyer in Knoxville. And he achieved a great deal of his fame through the MacArthur, not MacArthur, what were those hearings in Washington? McCar McCar McCarthy. McCarthy. McCarthy here, hearings. Yes. He came up there on the, that, that uh, uh, series of hearings and made a big impact on TV. But he was a great criminal lawyer. And what was his nickname? The Terror of Telico Plains. 
<laughs> so you Ray introduced you to the court, and then um, you, 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 your law office was in, in Rockwood. Yes. Tell us about your first law office. Well, Judge McLuhan, or Lloyd McLuhan, had his office there, and uh, there was an extra room next to him. <clears throat> it was very poorly handled. It hadn't been used in years. It had a 12 to 15 foot ceiling and no window. <laughs> so the owner of it was a grocery store owner named Bristow. He had the store below us. We were up a steep set of steps. And right across from us on the other side of the building was a beauty shop. And when they had permanence in that old-fashioned way, <laughs> gosh, it would just run you out of the, the building. Terrible smell. But anyway, McLuhan arranged for me to get the extra office. And they put in a, a one set of uh, four uh, bulbs, fluorescent bulbs, hanging the ceiling. And... Uh, they made a window right at the top. We were next to a building that would not permit a window, but right up at the top. They put in a window and they put a floor in it. They spent all together about $120. And I was worried about that if I'd be there long enough to pay them back at $10 a month, which was the rental. And you got your heat and cooling. No cooling, just your heat for that. There was no air conditioning. Now, did you practice on your own to start with? Well, I did, yes, but he helped me. Uh, McLuhan was the chairman of the board of the local federal savings and loan, and he would steer t uh, uh, title checks for me. Hammond Fowler, if you remember mm -hmm. him, I do. was their attorney, and Hi Hammond got most of the title work, but he would steer a little title work to me. You, you could do a a title report for $25. If you had to go to Clinton, Anderson County, or Cumberland County, you got $35 for it. This was the day, day of the $5 warranty deed. So what sort of things did you start out doing? You, you've mentioned making deeds and doing title searches. What else did you do? Well, I had little uh, Justice of the Peace cases, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> it wasn't unusual to try to collect bills at that time. And I really got into it once there. I, I had a, an old constable named Henry Rines. He wore overalls all the time and a big old four-inch cowboy hat. And I worked out about, I had worked with people who'd make promises and wouldn't come through. So I worked out about 20 civil warrants for justice of the peace. And I'd go to the door and ask them if they were going to make a payment. And if they didn't seem very cooperative, I'd tell Henry to serve the, the J.P. Warren on them. <laughs> that made them wish they had cooperated with you, I right. guess. <laughs> and I'll never forget, one man called out to his wife, Helen is on a dentist. This dentist had just begun work and he was called in on the Korean War. So he asked me if I'd try to collect some of his bills for him to help his family. Hey, Helen, bring those teeth out here. They're not any good anyway. <laughs> did, did you have any staff, anybody that helped you do the typing? Well, McLuhan's secretary did typing for me, yes. What schedule did you work when you started up? Monday through Saturday. I'd left the office about 5 o'clock Saturday evenings. What time would you go in in the mornings? Say uh, 8 o'clock. So about 8 to 5, right. Monday through Saturday. Right. Did you ever work on Sundays as well? I did alone. I didn't take clients, but I, I went to the office often. I still remembered old Judge Jones. The law is a jealous mistress. And he was so right. Mm -hmm. When you were sworn in um, and started practicing, how quickly did you start going to court? Well, it started very 
I w rode over with Mr. McLuhan. I didn't have anything to do at the office, so when he would go to court, I would ride to court with him. Now, court was in uh, Kingston. Kingston. And I was in Rockwood. Rockwood. Did you, did you travel outside of Roan County to do cases? Very little, maybe to uh, uh, Crossville and uh, Clinton. You were in a judicial district that, you were in a judicial district that included. Uh, oh, seven counties. Large counties. Did you travel within that judicial district very no, much? No. No. I didn't know anyone there, any no. of those places. But uh, you know, Judge Oliver was elected about the time I came home, and he went all the way down to Polk County. Mm -hmm. He was in Monroe County. Right. Uh, but there was enough business in Roan County that you didn't need to... Well, there wasn't that much business, but I didn't know anybody anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> well, what kind of cases did you handle? Well, I, and a lot of it was collection cases, and a lot of it was uh, doing title examinations for the savings and loan. And that saved me for the first two or three years, you know, what little I could get out of that. It's pretty quick money. If you took a case in court, you might be months getting a trial. But if you did a title examination within 30 days, you'd be paid. So that saved me having that. Do you remember how much you made that first year or two you were in practice? I would say about $3,000. Does that seem like a lot of money? No, it didn't seem like much, but I was grateful to get it. <laughs> And then over the years, uh, as you progressed in your practice, did you take more cases outside of Roan County, or have you pretty much practiced in Roan County? I pretty well stayed in Roan County. I, I took more in Crossville at the time. At that moment, uh, Crossville was short on the lawyers, and they would come to Roan County for their lawyer. And, and generally, what sort of cases did you, over your practice, have you handled? Well, I handled a lot of divorce cases early on. We, uh, it cost $10.50 for the clerk, and we get $25 down at the beginning of the case. So that was $35.50. If a lady had that, she could get a lawyer. <laughs> uh, I, I got out of divorce cases not long after that, but I tried enough of those. And uh, I guess when I first came in, Lloyd McLuhan had a real good accident case. I say real good in that there were serious injuries and he was able to recover on it. But these were in the days that the $5,000 was the minimum insurance you could carry and $10,000 was about all anybody carried. So a big case wasn't much. Wasn't a big. But anyway, I, I saw the, the benefit of uh, handling contingent fee cases, and it looked good. So I, I got into that when I could. Did you also do insurance defense? And did you do any, any insurance defense work? Extremely little, if any. I, I can remember maybe one or two, not much. So mainly on the civil side, you did. Con Contingent accident cases, right. some domestic, um, right. and the g general civil. You also did criminal work. Oh, I correct? loved criminal work, yes. And why, why did you, what was it about criminal work that you enjoyed so much? Well, just having a fight with the Attorney General. Now, Beecher <laughs> Witt was a very effective Attorney General. Beecher did not have an assistant at that time, except the first two or three days of the term of court, his assistant, uh, first was Jim Watkins of Loudoun County, would take care of the grand jury work while Beecher took care of the courtroom work. And when the grand jury was through, Jim Watkins was through, and Beecher, we, we had court for two weeks at a time. With seven counties, that's about all you could do. Three times a year, two weeks of court. And uh, you try a case about every day, the, the judge would try him just as quickly as he could.
and, and Beecher Witt's preparation for trying a criminal case was what? Beecher's preparation was to get the indictment. He would look over that indictment and read it to the grand jury, and that would be the first time he'd seen it. And he did a beautiful job. He, he could just work up a case from there as though he'd studied it for a month. And, and for those who are not familiar, Beecher Witt's district as a district attorney general was, what, eight or nine counties? Seven counties. Seven counties? Because he's from Monroe County, so yes. he, he covered a large territory. You had to respect him. He was just right on top of it. A hard prosecutor. So how many years have you practiced law? Me? Uh-huh. 69 years. 69 years. At what point did you, or have you decided to slow down your practice any? <laughs> oh, I have slowed it down. I cut out jury work about five years ago. Uh, it was not without some suggestion from the judges. <laughs> <laughs> but so, I, it was over time. I cut that out. So after 64 years of practicing, you cut out jury trials. Right. And then, um, it, are you, do you still go to the office? Yes, I try bench cases. You try, still try bench cases. How many days a week do you go into your office? Five days a week. What was the last, do you remember the last jury trial that you tried? Or was it, was it anything remarkable? Or was it just... Well, I think it was down in Ray County. I had a case involving a, a young boy who was going down to Watts Bar to uh, do something about a, a, a job down there. <clears throat> and he was making a pass on a two-lane road. The other two lanes were tied up in construction and hit a car head on. And on that case, I had my son Pat with me just in case I needed him. And in doing the voir dire on the jury, I mentioned something about my client was heading, and I pointed out toward Watts Bar Dam. One of the jurors spoke up and said, you mean Watts Bar Dam? And I said, yes, sir, thank you. Well, that just started it. The jury kept correcting me <laughs> when I would make a mistake or forget something, it fell in. We were trying that case together. <laughs> did you win that case? Yes, I did. The man got, there, were, there was one death, one serious bodily injury, and they had him with a, a, a death case. The jury fined him $50. So yes, I consider that a victory. And at, at age 92, when's the last time you filed a lawsuit for a client? Last week. <laughs> Did you ever want to be a judge? No. Why not? I'd just rather have a... I, I don't want to be up there neutral. I want to have an opinion on a case, whether it's good or bad, I want to have one. I would rather just be an advocate. That, to me, is what the law calls for. And being an advocate, how, how do you think other lawyers viewed you in court? How do you think other lawyers viewed you? Did they see you as an easy lawyer or one of these tough lawyers? I don't think they saw me as easy because I'm, I'm a, as far as being a smart student, I'm not. I'm, I'm just a medium student. And the only way I can plan to win cases is to work harder than my adversary. I needed to know more about the case and more about the law in the case. So I worked extremely hard, and I think lawyers soon learned that. I would know my case when it came to court. Well, I remember coming over to Roan County and trying a case with you as a young lawyer. And you and beat me. No, you beat me. No, and you no. did it with a smile on your face, and you were so nice. And I thought, <laughs> what happened? I thought I was doing so well. <laughs> I don't remember it that way. You did well. Well, thank you. Were, were there judges who influenced you in your career? Good judges or bad judges who influenced you? I, I think Judge McMurray was one of the best I ran into. He was just tops. And Judge McMurray was from Blount County, who then went on to Loudoun County. Loudoun County. Yes. And he 
then was appointed to the Court of Appeals. And he went to the Court of Appeals and he died an untimely death. Mm -hmm. He had a bad heart. He but I sure did respect him. He was a good judge. Any other judges you re that stand out in your mind? Well, Lloyd McLuhan, my old partner, became the judge of the criminal court after he'd made enough uh, uh, practice to retire. And he was good. He really took his job seriously. And he was a, he was a good judge on the law and the facts. You have... Um been compiling some stories about some of your most in, more interesting cases and I've had the great opportunity to read some of those and you're an incredibly gifted writer and I hope you're going to put those in a book format. Um, I wanted to ask you about a few of those cases um, and I'll ask you about one of your, this was not in the, what you wrote up but I, I know about it from talking with you. You, um, after you became licensed you had the opportunity to represent your father in a criminal case. Yes. And tell me a little bit about your father and how that case came about. Well, I didn't know my father. He, I was, I knew he had left town. I knew a little about him. He uh, was a law violator, but he was a good man when my mother married him. And I was their third child. And I don't know whether the depression did it or what, but something made him just go wrong. And uh, about 1943, after I'd finished school, I was working over at Oak Ridge. And some man got my last name and asked me more about my family background. He said, I have to tell you, uh, I was a deputy sheriff in Roman County in 1926. and said, I was in a gunfight with your father the day you were born. Mm -hmm. It's the first time I'd heard that. But he had gone to prison for some reason. And I remember once looking into my mother's mail and there was a, a letter from a West Virginia prison he'd been in. So up until I was about 10 years old, I'd never met him. I remember once I met him on the street. I recognized him, but I was intimidated. Didn't try to speak and he walked right by me. Anyway, he... Uh, <coughs> <clears throat> he was a criminal. He killed people. And uh, mother just divorced herself from him entirely. He didn't support us and she didn't ask him to. I had kids at school that would call me Little John Cooley because he had such a reputation. And they yelled that at me as a form of insult. They were usually big enough, I wouldn't fight them. <laughs> but uh, after I got out of law school, I didn't see him. He didn't, didn't attend my graduation or anything else. Uh, he killed a man in 1950, and uh, he wanted me to help out with it. Well, he actually hired Howard Baker Sr. He was tried up in Morgan County. And Howard Henry, who was Howard Jr.'s name, uh, was about a semester ahead of me in school. Neither one of us knew how to try a lawsuit. We sat at the council table like we were lawyers during that trial. <laughs> now you're talking about Senator Howard Baker, who would then be, go on to be Senator Howard Baker. Right, right. That was Howard Henry. Howard Henry. So we sat there and looked like lawyers. We didn't take any part in the trial. Uh, he was convicted of a reduced charge, manslaughter maybe, and we appealed, and at that time you didn't have the intermediate court of criminal appeals, so it went straight to the Supreme Court. We argued it up there, I say we did, our lawyer argued it up there, and they affirmed, and there was a boy named, a lawyer named Tommy Thompson in Nashville, who had been a great help to Governor Browning. And as you know, or probably know, Governor Browning was famous for pardons. He issued more than probably any governor ever did. So we hired Tommy Thompson, and by the time the Supreme Court affirmed that sentence, he had a pardon. And that wasn't justice. I didn't particularly like it, but at any rate, he, he was pardoned. He didn't have to serve any time. 
Hmm. Did you see him after that? Sure. I would represent him at times. <clears throat> Off and on. Were you, um, I, I'm going to talk to you about some of your cases, but I wanted to skip over a little bit. Were you involved in politics growing up? Oh, I just loved democratic <laughs> politics. I can remember just as a kid, it must have been 32, I would have been six years old, when Roosevelt ran against uh, Hoover. And I can remember people saying bad things about Herbert Hoover. Did you ever think about being a Republican? No, no. <laughs> My mother felt that Franklin Roosevelt kept us all from starting. And what he did with TVA would have probably accomplished that. Did you ever think, did you ever run for public office? No. Did you ever think about it? No. Well, I've thought about it, but not very well. Why, why not? I just don't want a public office. I want to be a lawyer. I want to try lawsuits. I don't get to do much of that now, but that's what I've always wanted to do. Well, since you started practicing law nearly 70 years ago, uh, what's some, what are some of the biggest changes you've seen in law practice? Well, back then, it seemed that lawyers felt that to impress it is all male jurors then, you know. And lawyers seemed to think that the, the, the way to make a sincere argument in a case was to talk loud. And they would just shout, and I remember one of our best lawyers, Ralph Tedder, he had a, a big shock of gray hair and he would bring that hand down and bring the hair down over his face with it and shout to a jury and the jurors liked that. But that's been changed and now lawyers talk soft. I guess the judge had a lot to do with that, but lawyers know that you don't need to shout to get attention. How else has the practice changed? Well, I think lawyers are a lot better, a lot better uh, uh, versed in the law. Back then, you didn't have the uh, the meetings that you have now among lawyers, the instructional meetings, and you know, all. You, you do a lot more toward education now than you did then. And cases, oh my goodness, uh, you didn't have rules in Tennessee. You just had the rules of procedure or rules of evidence. Right. You didn't have any of those. And you just had to know, you know, it was it was something for a lawyer to get up and say, well, there's an old Polk County case that's not reported, and argue that with the judge. <laughs> but uh, there's a lot more time and attention given to education now. How are judges different now than they were when you started? Well, I think they listen a lot more to the law. Uh, when I started, the older lawyers got all the attention. When they said something, the judge was influenced by it. But now, starting, well, Wayne Oliver started us all. That's and Judge Wayne, Wayne Oliver. Judge Wayne Oliver was out of uh, uh, Blunt County, and uh, he was appointed at about 1943, no, 47. Somebody retired or passed away so that he had to run again in 1950. And uh, I can remember, I, I was really impressed with him and I did a lot of work for him. And uh, I had a man named St. George Jones, who was an insurance agent. And he told me how much he would like to get off jury service. So I thought, well, I've helped Judge Oliver so much, I took him through the hosier mill and introduced him to everybody. And, that he'll, he'll listen to me, and I approached him on that, and bam, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> this man served by the jury. <laughs> well, when you started practicing, there were not any women on juries, oh, no. or, or certainly lawyers or judges. We uh, had one lawyer, Irma Greenwood. She from, was good. She was Knoxville. a deep graduate. All right. Well, how, how has the entry of women into the profession changed things? Well, they've changed a lot. My goodness. Uh, Irma Greenwood was respected among men. She mm -hmm. was tough. But uh, since that time, women have attended law school and, and gone into practice. 
and they've got women on the jury now, so it's a big difference. How is it different? How, how has it changed? Well, I think women give a lot more attention. They're grateful to, still grateful to be involved in the court proceedings. And they, they listen closely to the case. Now, you take down in Dayton, the uh, head of the jury commission down there was a man named Cooley, no relation to me, but uh, they would bring in a, a, a group for the court and when they didn't use them, they would keep them till the next term. <laughs> and the lawyers down there, Wendell McKenzie and a few of the old time lawyers would be on buddy stage with all those jurors. <laughs> and it was something else when you'd go into that county and try a jury case. Would you get some home cooking, as we oh, say? Oh boy, you sure did, yeah. But I, I think women are a lot more uh, sincere about their work on the jury. I really do. And what about women lawyers and judges? They're good. They're good. Thank you. I'm not just saying it because <laughs> you are one. I, I, I have experienced that. Yeah. Women take it more seriously. They're grateful to be on it. Did you have lawyers who were role models for you as you were coming along? Lawyers that you looked to for help or inspiration? Well, Start out, I told you about Foster Arnett. When I came home to practice, that was a time of a real bad accident in which uh, uh, my mentor at that time, Lloyd McLuhan, had the plaintiff's case. Foster Arnett came in on that, and uh, the man was in bad shape in the Rockwood Hospital, and Foster gave him blood, his opponent. His opponent. <laughs> so I was impressed with him. But I'll tell you, and I'm not saying this because he's related to you, but I guess the most impressed I had was with uh, J.D. Lee. We had then, I had decided I wanted to be a plaintiff's lawyer. I was a few years ahead of J.D. But uh, we had a, you may remember the name, it was a, the National group, and he was the president real early on. American Trial Lawyers. What's it? The American Trial Lawyers no, Association. No, before that. Oh, before that. It had a, a convoluted name. Okay. Uh, and that's when he was president. And uh, I joined that group, and, and I think we got a lot of help. We got mail-outs that told us how to try cases, and uh, I soon decided that was a way to make a living in a small town. Well, those, contingent those, fees. Well, that, and that money came from the insurance company, so right. it wasn't out of any right. poor woman or poor man's pocket. It made a difference, yeah. didn't it? Well, what was it about J.D. that you thought was, was good, or what did you like about that? Well, he just began to get big verdicts, and I started watching him. He was cool. <laughs> <laughs> he, he knew how to pick out certain violations of the law, and talk about that with the jury. And that really carried its weight. He got good verdicts. So I, I associated him on several cases and I enjoyed trying something with him. He, uh, especially in Monroe County, he just owned the jury down there. They all looked up to him. And he'd always be so cool. He never raised his voice. So uh, I enjoyed working with him I believe you all had similar, probably had similar backgrounds and similar Somewhat. dispositions, yeah. I think, yeah. which probably helped. In looking back over your uh, nearly 70 years of practicing law, uh, how do you feel about being a lawyer? I love it. I love it. I never felt old Judge Jones that the law is a jealous mistress, and she's demanded most of my time. Did you ever have any regrets about becoming a lawyer? I guess I do sometimes, especially when I'm getting a divorce. I realize I haven't given my wife the time I should have. I've spent too much time nights and days and all in the law office. But you enjoyed all those times, didn't hmm? you? You enjoyed all of those times. Every bit of it. Still do. What is it that you enjoy most about practicing law? Well, you're helping people. You're doing something for them, and you make a pretty good living with it. 
But I think helping people is the main thing. We have a big focus now on pro bono representation. Right. And that's a fairly recent development. Did, have you always done pro bono representation? Listen, I don't try to keep a record of that and send in to the state bar. But uh, maybe I'll take a $500 case for $100. I know they can't pay it. And I'll quote my fee and the man looks over at his wife. She looks at him and they're grateful they know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, I've, I've done a lot of pro bono. And did anybody ever have to tell you that's what you ought to do, or have you just always no. known that? No, I just want to help people. And now that you're slowing down some, what do you miss most about practicing law? Trying jury cases. Have that knock on the door, and the judge says the jury is ready to return its verdict, and you all hold your breath and wait. <laughs> You um, clearly have won a lot of those jury trials, and, and I hope so. And and it, it, does it start with picking a good jury? That helps, doesn't it? It doesn't. Ha What's your secret to picking a good jury? I think you try to read your juror when you're talking with him, him or her, and uh, you get an idea right then if they're listening to you. You get an idea whether they respect you. It may be a wrong idea. You may take one on and he's hurt you, some, some that surprised you. But I, I think if you, if you interrogate each juror in a friendly way, you can see whether they have respect for you. That makes a difference. They're going to listen to you in the trial. What are ways that they show you they respect you or don't respect you? Well, I think it's just a matter of eye contact and their response to the questions you would ask. Uh, I think you, you can gather from that if they are actually thinking like you do. You can't, ask, you can't excuse everyone who doesn't. <laughs> you don't have that many challenges usually, but you'll take as few as you can. What advice do you have for a young lawyer just starting out? You mean to try a case? All right, just a young lawyer out of law school, what, what advice would you give those lawyers? Well, I would tell him to try every case he can. I've had to persuade my clients to go to trial on cases. I had a case once where a young boy uh, was on his motorcycle and was hit by a man, and he had brain damage. and. Uh, this man had offered us, he's from a very poor family, the boy was. His father would come to me, to me. They were offered $20,000, and they wanted to take it, and I persuaded them not to. This Willard Kittle was circuit judge. We went in and picked a jury, and the defense lawyer sent over again that offer of $20,000, and my client insisted on taking it. And did I get a chewing out from the judge for settling the case after he picked the jury there that day? He was real hard on me about that. And I finally stood up and said, Judge, I don't want this settlement. I didn't want it. My clients want it. I owe it to them to do what they want. Uh, what advice do you have for new judges? New judges? All right. I just say, listen patiently. Don't get, don't get impatient with your lawyers. Did you have judges who ever got impatient with you? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> Was there anything you could do about it? Not much. Not much. <laughs> I had a great respect for Judge Wayne Oliver, but he, uh, he really pushed lawyers. And I remember... I was one of the first ones. I stood up and told the jury that we were suing for maybe $50,000. He clamped down on the bench and, and told me then, you're not to do that again. You don't tell the jury how much money you're suing for. And he, did, he enforced that over his seven-county district until J.D. Lee got somebody in the legislature to make that mandatory. 
judge couldn't order you not to. Did he also do something similar with the opening statement? Oh yes, uh, yes. He was very restrictive on what you had to say to the jury. He just thought that uh, the juries were were fools that you could do something with them with rash statements. But they're, they're not, they were not that. They had better judgment than that. In fact, I think they looked down on a lawyer that would try to tell them what to do. Now what was your, when you would try a case to the jury, what did you try, how did you try to get them on your side? What was your secret to influencing that jury? Well, I don't know, except I wanted to know more detail about the case than my adversary. And that worked most of the time. If you knew things that you wouldn't, you wouldn't give up on during the trial, details that uh, you feel that your adversary did not keep up with, that could save you. I felt pedestrian as a, a smart lawyer, but I felt that uh, if I knew more about it and worked harder at it, I could get more to the jury. And you did that by spending a lot of time. Would exactly. that be fair to say? Yes. How do you want to be remembered as a lawyer? Well, I think people do know me as a lawyer who tried to be fair. I want to be remembered as that. But that I've won cases. And I think I'm remembered as that. What did you, you've talked to us about practicing law and how that made you, you were so busy. Uh, what did you do for fun outside the law? What are some things you did or do outside hobbies or interests? I never did have much of a hobby. <clears throat> I tried golf for a few years and I wasn't any good at it. And uh, then I went to farming and I have enjoyed that immensely. Every Saturday I spend on the farm. And what are you, what are you growing? Cattle farm. Cattle farm. Okay. I'm not going to be a dirt farmer. <laughs> That's hard work. Did you do enough of that growing up? Yes, yes, I sure did. <laughs> How many uh, cattle do you have? About 65 counting calves. Okay. I've got a manager. Mm -hmm. He does a great job. He has a farm next to mine and is totally honest and very wise in the operation of a farm. I mentioned earlier you had compiled some stories on some of your memorable cases and I wanted to ask you about a few of those. You had a story entitled Victory with Regret and just to summarize Victory with Regret, it involved the burglary of a house of a family and their child was blind and, right. and he had his name in braille written on his, attached to his clothing and a man you were appointed to represent was charged with breaking into this home and, and Burger, stealing yes. and they found some of that clothing with braille on it in his home. <laughs> Yeah, but telltale evidence, wasn't it? <laughs> so it, it appeared to be an open and shut case until you came along. Uh, so tell us how, how that turned out. Well, this was terrible. The judge would only come in for two weeks, and he would go through his docket. So about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, this boy came up, and he was, he was poor. He had nothing. And the judge appointed me to defend him and scheduled it for trial the next morning. <laughs> so I don't think I had had an adequate education on search warrants. Don't believe we got into that enough in my law school. So I went home that evening and studied, I took a copy of the indictment and studied it. I soon saw that the case was going to turn on that search. They got a search warrant and went into this defendant's house and found the clothing with the Braille identification on it. So I studied search warrants and I called the squire who had issued that search warrant. We didn't have Sessions Court then, it was Justice of the Peace Courts. 
he couldn't remember anything. You can see he didn't want to remember anything. I was suspicious. So about midnight, I called the jailer and asked him some things about it. I don't think he realized what he was telling me, what it was doing, but he told me how the, the justice of the peace would come in and sign a whole pad of search warrants. All blank. Yes. So if an officer wanted a search warrant, he'd just come in and tear one out. And, and then that was fill what in happened the details. Here. Mm -hmm. It was very common practice. <laughs> <laughs> Until you ask about it. So that morning, I didn't get through till about 3 o'clock, and I worked up a, a motion for an, uh, an instanter subpoena of the Justice of the Peace. When I was appointed, the, 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 the father of this boy was a man I had worked with up at the iron furnace named Wellesley. And Wellesley was mad that I entered the plea of not guilty. So he hired Ralph Tedder, who was our primary uh, trial lawyer in Roan County. They came over that morning, and Ralph Tedder and Beecher Witt, the Attorney General, and the, uh, the victims' uh, people there, not the victim, the, 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 the uh, victim of the theft, they got behind a wire cage and they knew what I was doing. So they spent about 30 minutes over there, really, really busy talking to one another. Then they stepped forward and dismissed the case. Because <laughs> it was a bad search. Bad search. Hmm. <laughs> so the victim, you, you knew the, 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 the victim yes, well. Yes, they were friends. This kid came on, had developed a great sense of hearing, and was a good piano tuner. Somebody could drive him about in a van and he had it all on the side of the van and he was a piano tuner. He did well until he died just two or three years ago. You mentioned uh, Beecher Witt, the attor district attorney general, and, and the judge in the district was named Judge Sue Hicks. A man, Sue K. The boy, Hicks. The boy named Sue, right? Right. <laughs> now they were both from Madisonville, so I knew them well. Um, did you have a, you, you've got a story entitled Principal, and you had a little run-in with Judge uh, Hicks. Tell us about that. Well, Judge Hicks, I'll have to say he, he didn't spend a lot of time in evidence in studying law. <laughs> <laughs> Beecher Witt was such a good trial lawyer, he could just run anything by the judge. So Beecher, I was defending the case along with my mentor Lloyd McLuhan and uh, Beecher ran something by and I jumped up and objected as hearsay. The judge overruled me. So Beecher did it again here in a few questions. And the same thing. I jumped up and objected and the judge impatiently overruled me. And he came up the third time. The judge just stopped things, took his time and wrote me out in front of the jury that I didn't have good judgment, that I was just unduly ho holding up the case and just made it look like I was a bad lawyer. And I was just seething with insult and I whispered to McLuhan, I can't handle this. You go ahead and try the case. I eased out. It was cold weather and I stayed in the courthouse and at noon I went back up to get my coat from the courtroom, and the only two left in there, in the courtroom, and the jury had left, were uh, uh, George Sarton, who was the chief deputy sheriff, and Judge, uh, Judge uh, Hicks. George said, Polk, the judge wants to talk to you. The judge came over and he had just put on his top coat and was putting on his glove, and he took that glove off and held his hand out and spoke, I want to apologize to you. I was wrong on those objections you made. And I wouldn't take his hand. I said, Judge, if you really want to apologize, I suggest that you wait until we reconvene court one o'clock, have the jury in the box, and those people back in the courtroom who heard what you did and apologize in front of them. Well, I could hear it just barely if that's the way you feel about it. He whirled around and left. So that's where that ended. 
Did he apologize to you in front of the jury? No. No, no, no. No, no. I went back at 1 o'clock and we tried the rest of the case. That was a brash thing to say to a, to a judge. It was just so out of line. It was in, inappropriate. And I, I just think that if a lawyer came to make an objection and have some fair treatment from the judge, it's bad news. But you know, Judge Hicks uh, had gotten rather impatient. He was, he was getting old at that time and he had a bad hip and walked with a terrible limp. And I guess he was in a bad mood most of the time. So I had worked hard for him. He had a cousin named Byron Hicks who ran a drugstore in, in Rockwood. Byron was a politician. He pretty well controlled the county. And uh, we did a lot for Judge Hicks when he ran for election. Those seven counties Roan was one of his better ones. So I didn't expect favors from him, but uh, I didn't expect to be dressed down like that. Did he, uh, off, did he provide a ride to court for his district attorney general? They rode to court together, together. every day. The judge day. and the DA rode together. <laughs> Seven counties. <laughs> and it's hard to imagine that they did all that time together and didn't mention their, their caseload. What are we going to do today? Who's trying? <laughs> you had an interesting murder case. Uh, 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 well, you had many interesting murder cases, but one involved Curly Pope. Yes. Uh, and he was found shot to death in his bed. He was a man who'd made a lot of money in the pinball and uh, uh, machine operations. Yes. Jukebox, I guess, pinballs, machines, and maybe saved some money because he didn't, perhaps didn't pay the IRS all that was due them. It was an invitation, wasn't it? You see, he <laughs> once, once a week he would send out his agents rather than himself most of the time. They had the, the lock, the keys there to open up the slot machine, take out the money and split with the owner of the business and take the rest and go with it. So it was kind of a wide open invitation. And he and his wife, Pat, had a, did they have a difficult marriage? They did. He had a, a girlfriend on the side and they had split. She was in a separate bedroom. And did they have a, um, a daughter at home, a 16-year-old? Yes, they did. All right, so Curly's found dead in his bed, and his wife's found in another bedroom with a shotgun in her bed, obviously the murder weapon. Yes. And you tell us about your representation of her. Well, I had a call from uh, Curly's lawyer. He handled Curly's legal business. In Bayon, Curly had several counties that he had ran these machines. This lawyer came to me and said, uh, we would like you to uh, plead Pat in, see if you can get her something less than a stiff penitentiary sentence. If you can get her anything think, at all to help, we want you to plead her in. I said, well, I don't know enough about it right now but in the meantime, the Rome newspaper had come out with the sheriff's chief investigator standing there holding the shotgun like he had just won an Olympic trophy <laughs> with a big smile. I thought, so much for fingerprints. So I said, well, I'll do this. I'll look into it. If I think there's a defense, I'll try the case. But if I don't, I'll try to plead it in. So the more I looked into it, the more fishy it sounded. Well, now, it did appear to be rather open and shut at the beginning because did. he was dead in his bed. She had the murder weapon in her bed. Not only that, but the daughter said she witnessed her mother shooting through the door, the open door to the bedroom. Right. All right, so now how were you able to save Pat from the penitentiary? Well, that daughter was in a tempestuous, red-hot relationship with a, a boy who was burglarizing all around town. He was mean. And Curly had discovered his daughter and that boy on a second floor bedroom engaged in sex. The boy went out the second floor window to escape. And uh, I, my suspect was him. And in fact, that morning, 
after the police had been there investigating, the Harriman police dispatcher was a good friend. She called me and told me that the police had caught this daughter and the boy in copulation out in the shrubbery outside the front of the house that morning. I thought, they're just out of their mind. And the more I looked into it, Pat, I never did ask her if she did it. She never did want to talk about it. She didn't want me to have anything bad to say about Curly. And uh, I went up to the place she had been. She had had an alcoholic problem. And that place was up in the, on the North Carolina line. And I went up to visit that place. They had cleaned her out about three or four months before the killing. They got her clean. And I talked to them about it. And she had worked hard at it and, and kind of thrown the habit. But I learned that this boy had tempted her with alcohol later. So then things just kept coming into place. <laughs> so we went to trial. And uh, I had a real good legal secretary at that time, Lois Duff. I had her come to court with me and sit there with Pat at the... At the uh, the lawyer's counsel table. Pat just looked down the whole time. She didn't look up at the jurors, just looked down. She was a pitiful person. Well, the first witness on by the state was the chief investigator who let the jury know how good he was with weapons and he showed you how to break a shotgun down and load the shells in it. And he couldn't get it back. <laughs> <laughs> it was beautiful, beautiful. Because they found shells on the bed where they found the shotgun. And it was so embarrassing for him, he couldn't get the gun back into action. <laughs> so it was very unlikely she could have done that. I had thought I might have to put Pat on to show she couldn't, but she was a slight person. I, I'm sure that did the job there. But I think the highlight, well, one of the girls testified, there were two daughters, and this one was the one who was there at home, that she saw her mother stand in the hall and fire that shotgun twice into Curly's bedroom and it went into his back on the bed. He was on his side. So I was able to bring out by her that she was awfully tight with this boy who I claimed to be a suspect. Then they brought in Mrs. Newcomb. She was a next door neighbor. She was a retired school teacher. And if you had a movie on it, you wouldn't have made her up any better than she was. She was in a gray suit, had iron gray hair, and just a, such an attractive elderly lady. <laughs> and when she got through, she testified that she heard that shot that night and she heard somebody leaving the house. That kind of fit our theory. When she got off the witness stand, she walked over and hugged Pat, <laughs> whispered something in her ear and left. The jury was just jaw hanging down. <laughs> she put an atmosphere on that case that couldn't have been there otherwise. So the jury returned a verdict of not guilty. And then for a sequel, we had written all along about Curly's money, what was happening to the estate. We got no response. I had a personal call from an IRS agent. Want to know what I knew about Curly's money? And I said, we don't know anything. We haven't been able to learn anything. Well, we got a copy. He brought me a copy of the the uh, tax return, inheritance tax return. They have a full page on there for the, the spouse. And they wrote on there for the, the spouse, nothing happened, spouse her wife killed her wife murdered her husband. So, uh, long story short, they were able to open up the doors to that, and we were able to get 
a share of Curly's money. I think his children would have soon have seen a, conv a conviction. That way she wouldn't have inherited anything. And they would have gotten the, the estate. They would have shared it, three of them. Yeah. Which is why the lawyer for the estate, or Curly's lawyer, had called you initially to try to get you to plead. Yeah. Yeah. Pat in. And you were wise enough to do your job and represent her as you oh, were supposed to. Oh, I enjoyed to. that so much. <laughs> <laughs> now, do your uh, clients like Pat, uh, do they stay in touch with you after these cases? Oh, sure, sure, yes. And she and that daughter reconciled. Um, the next case I want to ask you about is the case of the disappearing evidence, and that's that's an important <laughs> Uh, interesting story, but also there's a good moral in that story for lawyers. You got to listen to your clients, don't you? Right. And tell old, us about that case. And this why that little was boy important. out of Morgan County had bought a carton of beer and was heading down Highway 27 out of Morgan County into Rome, and uh, the uh, trooper was chasing him and he chased him on into Rome County and pulled him over and arrested him and took the carton. It had four good bottles left in the carton. I felt like maybe my man wasn't really under the influence with only two beers missing. So we were trying the case in uh, Rome County where he made the arrest. And uh, my client kept nudging me he thought that the uh, deputy or the highway petition, uh, official had taken the rest of that beer home with him. And he told me that. So he took my beer. I said, I'm not going to ask him something like that. Well, he kept taking in my coattails. Ask him what he did with the beer. So finally, just to quieten him down, I said, all right, what did you do with the beer? Well, he didn't answer. I said, did you take it home and drink it? He hung his head down after a long pause and said, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> now, up to that point, had he been a very good witness for the state? Hmm? Up to that point, had yeah, he been yeah, a very he, good he, witness? He was a good witness, but he lost his composure on that one. And that was it. <laughs> the jury found my man not guilty, but I... I was mad at my man because he kept insisting on asking him that stupid question. <laughs> you got to listen to him sometimes. Sometimes. You um, had an interesting case involving State Representative Harry T. Byrne, who uh, <laughs> there's a statue to his honor in Knoxville. He's yes. very well thought of because of his pivotal role in the ratification of the 19th Amendment and women's right to vote. Um, but you've got a little different side of Harry T. Byrne. Or you saw a different side of Harry T. Byrne. Is that correct? Right. Tell us about that case. Well, let's see here now. Harry was the nephew of Bill Insminger. Bill Insminger's sister married Harry's father. No, Harry's uncle. So Bill Ensminger put Harry through law school. And, uh, and, and, and Bill uh, was president of the First National Bank of Rockwood and yes. was a very wealthy, wealthy yes, he, man in the He area. was president of that bank when it went under the 29 Depression. So along about 1965, we had come out of the Depression, and he said, Harry, I want you to uh, uh, put that property back in my name. He had had a nice farm and a nice whole block of commercial pro property in Rockwood. So Harry assented, consented to do that. And he wrote Uncle Bill a, a deed to sign. He read the first page of it, it looked like that uh, Uncle Bill was conveying the property from the corporation back to himself. So he signed it, went over for registration, 
And when he got it back, he was home, and he sat down in the comfort of his home and looked it all over. <laughs> that was the first page. The second page, he had made himself a, an owner, owner for his life, and he was in his middle to late 80s at that time. And on his death, it went to Harry's sister down in uh, Sweetwater, Nauda. He was furious. Because that so, was not the agreement. Is that no, right? No, <laughs> it was supposed to be back in Uncle Bill. Right. So he had us, us being Lloyd McLuhan and myself, bring a suit. And since the, uh, Harry was a member of the Roan County Bar, uh, our chancellor recused himself. And Glenn Woodley, you may remember him. I do. He was, he was a good chancellor. He was tough. And Glenn Woodley came up and heard the case and decided that Harry had complete, committed fraud on his uncle, set the deed aside. Harry had uh, Frank Qualls and Leonard Ladd as his counsel, and they appealed, and it was going to the Supreme Court. And Frank Qualls had been in touch with Lloyd McLuhan, my partner, that Harry had never paid them, and they were not going to go any further unless they got paid. So Harry turned up that morning in trial, told the Supreme Court that his lawyers had some other engagement and they couldn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> we don't do the Supreme Court that way, do we? No, you don't. <laughs> so, it doesn't uh, work that way anymore. They told him they would not grant a continuance. So Harry said he would go ahead and argue his own case. And he argued his case. And McLuhan got up to argue our rebuttal. And after about five minutes or more, I noticed one justice was looking over at the other one, whispering something. And before it was over, all five were whispering back and forth. And I was very indignant about that. <laughs> they're, not, they're being crude and rude to my partner. Then the Chief Justice came down with his hand and said, Mr. McLean interrupted his argument, so you don't need to argue any further. We're dismissing this appeal. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had that happen? No, I haven't. I've never seen it I've happen never before. Seen, I've never heard of that happening either. Uh, I think that would be a rare case indeed. It was, yeah. <laughs> I want to finish with a, 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 another not guilty verdict you got for a, a man who was charged with murder, uh, Leon Burham. Burham, yeah. yeah. Dur What's the last name? Burham, B-U-R-U-M. Burham. Burham. He was charged with killing a man named Stink Wadley right. over a girl they were both dating. And, and I think Stink brought a, a knife to the fight, but Leon brought a gun. A shotgun. A shotgun, and as expected, the shotgun won out over the knife, <laughs> and, and Leon was charged with first-degree murder. Uh, and as you were trying that case, what was sort of the turning point in that case that well, got you I'll not guilty? Well, I'll give you just a little background. I had been in Sessions Court before, and the name Leon Burham was called out, and he wasn't in court at 9 o'clock. And uh, one of the deputies explained to the judge that Leon lived way out beyond him, and it was at least 15 miles from the courtroom, and that he might have had trouble getting in. He gave him some time. Well, the judge waited until 9.30 or 10 and called him out again, and the judge was pretty angry by that time. Well, Leon finally stumbled in court. He had walked 15 miles to get to court. He was a big old muscular boy who had a terrible, terrible speech impediment. He couldn't pronounce the word S under any circumstances to save his life. And as you say, he and uh, the boy uh, we only knew as Stink Wadley were dating the same black girl there in Harriman. So they both turned up at the same time. And Stink allegedly had a knife. We couldn't prove that because the knife didn't show up later. But uh, Leon said Stink had a knife, and Leon had a shotgun. And the jury was listening to it, and Leon testified, Tink, thumb at me. And I said, Top Tink. <laughs> and Tink tapped thumbing. And I said, Top Tink, and by this time he was waving his hands. 
And the third time, Tink tapped Tommy, and I topped him. <laughs> he shot half his head off and shot you. <laughs> but as bad as that sounded, the jury found it ludicrous. <laughs> they were laughing. <laughs> what he went through in his anxiety and top tink. So he he convinced them, along with your help, that they returned not guilty. Not guilty, yeah. self defense verdict. Yeah. I've got to tell you about one that I hadn't thought of when I was making these. I had a Saturday morning. It had to be a long time back because I quit working Saturdays. This old gentleman walked into me, and the movies couldn't have made him any more as being an old Westerner. He had a four-inch uh, hat, five-gallon hat, four-inch brim. Had just enough of a beard to show up on his face. Had a windswept face, weather-beaten, dressed accordingly, just looked like an old Western cowpoke. He came in and told me a story that I could not accept. He lived down Highway 58, and it, he said that a truck, tanker truck, pulled up in his yard, spitting out fluid. And they asked to use his phone. It was a General Electric truck. He went in and used the phone and army trucks turned up, and a dozer turned up, and they began dozing out his yard where that fluid had fell. <laughs> well, he really had me going. And said he understood then what he could hear, and he wouldn't tell him much, is they were taking all that dirt to Texas. Well, he left there, and I thought, now, wait a minute here. I said, you go on home and I'll, I'll see what I can find out and get you back. I called the sheriff's office and they had the same story. We don't know what's happening. There's something in that dirt. Long story short, it was the, the compound chemical that everybody put in uh, uh, boxes and hung on the poles. What do you call them? Power? The power pole, the electrical poles. Yes, they hung on electrical poles. It was a fluid they had in there that was stable, that wouldn't burn. And apparently it was very volatile fluid. Well, people turned up for one of the main chemical companies knocking on doors and telling people not to worry about it, that it was safe. <laughs> that scared me even worse. <laughs> so we finally learned, I forget the name of it now, I'll think of it maybe while we're talking, uh, that that fluid was very, very dangerous. And uh, the, 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 the chemical companies told us not to worry about it. The Japanese worked in it up to their elbows all the time, had no problem with it. Well, I never did believe that. Anyway, several of the people down there brought suit, had lawyers bring suit early, and, and uh, they couldn't get anywhere with them. I held on. I waited at least nine months before I filed suit. I had gone to the EPA in Atlanta, and they were very cheery about even talking about it, and so they knew of no bad effect of it. We finally found that by that time I had, had brought Foster Arnett on board with me. We had found a professor down at Miami University who knew all about it and was willing to come up and testify on it. And uh, we, we won a verdict on that. They were shipping that stuff to, Florida, to Texas and, and putting it away. They, they were loading it into 50-gallon drums from his yard. <laughs> and the jury went with us on it. And from that time on, we heard from people and lawyers in Arizona, all of, mostly the West, to get a copy of that suit. This was a very common chemical. 
some, some, I can't remember the name of it now. I've got it in a file somewhere. But uh, they stopped using it. They and all of the utility companies cut it out all over the country. And was yours one of the first cases where they had it been held the liable? The it case. was the case. It was the case that found it. Wow. Well, I've asked you a lot of questions about your growing up and your family and your cases. Is there anything I've not asked you that you want to add to your interview? Anything you want to add to your interview? I've asked you a lot of questions about different things. Anything I've not touched on you want to say? You've been very kind to me, and I, I have enjoyed it. No. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed it as well. I consider this the zenith of my oh. 69 years. Well, thank you. It's quite an honor to be able to interview you. It's an honor to be interviewed by you. Thank you. Thank you.